Hi, good morning, everybody. Time for a public service announcement from your host, me, Dr. White. Yesterday I had to, I didn't have to, I had to by the end of the month, bring in my car for the, you know, the air test quality, environmental test they do, the testing station. I've got an older car, and every two years when I have to bring it in, I'm always concerned how is my catalytic converter and everything else working on my car, which I keep it well kept up and serviced. But being an organic chemist and knowing about gasoline, there's something else I always do, and it seems to help so far, and it did yesterday. A week before, I'm going to have my car tested. What I do is let the gas tank go down to about uh, three-fourths empty or fourth full, and then I go either mobile or shell, because those are the best, shell is really the best, and put in, fill the tank with premium gas, the highest octane gas, and I do that twice. And the reason I do that is the premium gas is premium because they put more additives in to help clean your car and various parts of your engine, and that is a good thing. The other thing I do is I know from being a chemist, and I won't be teaching that in this course, but how fast the reaction goes is dependent on its temperature. There's a rule of thumb, and it's true most of the time, that every 10 degrees increase in temperature Celsius, the reaction rate doubles as things work better. So I always make sure, because mine's always in February, March, I go in on a warm day. And the other thing to help it along is, before I go in there, and I did it right coming from school, I'll go on the highway and make sure I drive nice and fast to warm up the car. So it's really been warmed up. I won't tell you how fast it's on the video tape. But I do have a radar detector. I was in the third one of 355. And I'll leave it at that. And I passed. Thank you. Hi. Right. Let's get back to chemistry that I'm discussing here. On Wednesday, I start teaching you a very important concept in all of chemistry. And that concept is one mole of a compound equals the atomic of an element equals the atomic weight of the element. The other thing is one mole of a compound one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight, MW stands for molecular weight, of that compound in first class in grams. And finally, one last thing.
you'll see right here, I have this so you can use it. But the important thing is you have to know how to use it. Just because I give it to you doesn't mean you'll successfully use this. And as you can see, one mole of a compound atomic weight, and I don't abbreviate there, one mole of, a compound, of an element atomic weight, one mole of a compound molecular weight, in grams of that, and the molecular weight is the sum of all atomic weights. So let's practice this again. Of a compound 
equals its molecular weight in grams of that compound. And we know that's 36.5. And that's how you find that second number. Because remember, when you have something equals something else, there's two ratios, one moles per grams or grams per mole, either way from that. And now before I pick up my calculator, I'm going to use my good buddies, my good friend unit analysis again, and say, what are my final units? This is grams times moles divided by grams. Anything divided by itself equals one. That cancels out. What units am I left with? Moles of HCl, which looks good. And now I'll take, pick up my calculator. and say, all right, I have 567.8 divided by 36.5. I hit enter, and I forgot the plus sign, so I go back here. And that's the answer my calculator gives me. Now, on test two, like test one, will say under your name, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And it will also say, please use all atomic weights for three significant figures. And notice here I have four significant. This is an exact number, doesn't play a role. Three significant. Therefore, my answer should be three significant figures. I'll let you round that off to three significant figures, then I'll do it. Time's up. Keep the one, keep the five, keep the five. The third five is my round off. That's five or higher. That was hard to figure out. Therefore, I drop that and everything else in the five in front. I treat it's by one. So that's 1.56 times 10 to the first mole. And that's how you use moles and grams or moles, atomic weight or moles and molecular. Oh, that was fun. Let's do another one.
came in late, don't forget to sign in before you leave today, please. And if you didn't bring your calculator, you just set it up. some ratio to my answer, what units do I want my answer to be in? Well, I found this out. And now I'll use unit analysis. I bet you thought I was going to say you're good by your good for oh, I said it. But anyways, whatever you're trying to get to goes on top of the ratio, the units. Whatever units you're trying to get rid of go underneath. And do I have some relationship between moles of water and grams of water? And the answer is yes. One mole of any compound water equals its molecular weight in grams. And the molecular weight is the sum of all atomic weights of that compound. Well, for one mole equals the molecular weight of water, and now you have to calculate that. And water has two hydrogens, one oxygen, two times 101, why 101? That's the atomic weight of hydrogen. I have oxygen, the atomic weight to three significant figures, 16.0. I'll do the math. Oh, I have to ask, am I invisible? White on white on white? Never mind. Anyways, add them up. When you do an addition, you have the same number of significant figures past the decimal as the number you're adding that has the fewest significant figures past the decimal. All zeros which are past the decimal are significant. This is one, this is two. Hope we all agree one is smaller than two. How do I round this off to one past the decimal? Keep the first significant figure. This is what I round off. That's four or less, so it's 18.0. And now before I pick up my calculator, I'll check my units. This is moles of water times grams of water divided by moles of water. Anything divided by itself equals one. That cancels out. I'm left with grams of water. It looks good. Now I'll go to my calculator. Remember to put the plus sign in for the spreadsheet. And my calculator gives me that number. 
And now I'll look at how many significant figures my answer should have by looking at the numbers I'm multiplying and dividing. Three significant figures, three exact number. My answer should have three. How do you round that off to three? Oh, that's an interesting one. I'll give you a whole five seconds to figure out how to round that off to three significant figures. Go. Four point two, four point six, point point seven five. Times up. All right. To round that off, you keep the three, keep the seven, keep the nine. That's your three significant figures. You look at the eight. Is that five or higher? Yep. So I'm going to drop that into two zeros. The number in front I'll increase by one. That becomes the number ten, which increases the seven by one. And to get three significant figures, the way I write that is. 3.80 times 10 to the fourth. And that's how you do it. You start, look at the problem, ask what am I being asked to find and the units, then what am I given, and then see if you can go from this to your answer. You have a ratio which you use unit analysis, your good buddy, your good friend, and you put it in there, and you know one mole of a compound equals its molecular weight. You calculate the molecular weight. Oh, let's do one more. I'm having a good time. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but when you burp, a lot of, most of the gas that's coming out of your mouth in a burp, that's chemistry too, is carbon dioxide. And if you look at a bottle of pop and you pour that in or a can into your glass before you drink it, you see all the pretty bubbles in there coming up? That's carbon dioxide. So let's work with carbon dioxide. Say you have a massive burp of 25.01 grams of CO2. How many gram moles of that did you just burp? That would be a good question. And I will tell you this to help you out. If you look at carbon, the atomic weight to three significant figures is 12.0, oxygen is still 16.0. Why don't you try and set that up and do it. And next time you see someone burp, say if you burp 25.051 grams, you know how many moles of CO2 you just burp? No, don't do that. People don't like the hearing chemistry when they burp.
Those who finish early, try this. One finger goes forward, the other back. You master that, do it with your thumbs. Don't try that while you're driving or operating heavy machinery. All right, anybody need more time? Do I want? Five, right, let's do it. So, the first thing when you see a problem like this, is to figure out what are you being asked to find and the units. So if I look at this, I'm trying to find how many, oh, how many moles, sorry about that, how many moles of CO2 are in, and what are we given? 25.01 grams of CO2. We're also given the molecular formula of CO2, and you'll be given a periodic table. So, the only thing I have to start with is this. What am I trying to get to unit-wise? This. And now I'll use unit analysis Whatever I'm trying to get to, the units go on top of this ratio. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of, the units go below. And it's important later on, especially in the semester, to put the formula there. It will be helpful. Now, where do I get those numbers? The important information on test number two, it will say one mole of compound equals its molecular weight in grams, and I'll also say the molecular weight of a compound is the sum of all atomic weights in a compound in grams. So in order to fill this in, one mole of CO2 equals its molecular weight. Well, I have to calculate that. And how do you do that? CO2, carbon dioxide, has one carbon, two oxygens. The atomic weight for carbon, I won't peep, but I know it by heart, is 12.0. Oh, I got it right. And the next one I know by heart, too, 16.0 for oxygen. If I did my math correctly, I get 1 times 12 is 12.0, 2 times 16.0, by the way, 2 is an exact number if you're ever wondering about that, is 32.0, I add it up, I get 44.0 if I did my math correctly, if not, I hope all of you correct me. And now, before I pick up my calculator, I'm going to check, do the units in this multiplication division give me the correct units of my answer. And notice this is grams of CO2 times moles of CO2 divided by grams of CO2. And grams divided by CO2 divided by grams of CO2, anything divided by itself is the number one, cancels out, I'm left with the right units, and I think I'm on the right path. And now I can go to my calculator. Take 25.01 divided by 44.0. Hit enter. My calculator gives me this number. Notice this is three significant, exact number four. What's the proper number of significant figures for my answer? When you're doing a multiplication division, the number of significant figures in your answer is the same as the number that has the lowest significant figures in your multiplication division. Three, four, I hope you all pick three. I'll let you round that off to three significant figures. I'll give you four seconds. 
3.28. Time's up. Keep the 5, keep the 6, keep the 8. The round off is 4. Is that 4 or less? Well, yeah, it's 4 or less. Therefore, I drop that, drop the 0, drop the 9, keep the 5.68. Add this times 10 to the minus 1, and that's how you do it. Now, for lab next week, I will go through, let me take a quick look at the problem set here. of the 
product. And because of that, everything you see around you that's been made uses this concept. I personally have written recipes or procedures for many chemical plants, companies I work for. That was part of my job as a senior level chemist and manager that make things, anything from the resin that holds sand together to make the molds for your car engine, to the molecules they use for fabric softeners, and the molecules they use for making soap, and other things too I won't go into. So it's a very powerful concept. And let me show you how to use it. Let's look at the following question. Question is, how many moles of hydrogen are needed to make 15.6 moles of water? And sometimes I'll write how many moles of hydrogen are needed I might write it this way. How many moles of hydrogen are needed to react with an excess of oxygen? That means you've got all the oxygen in the world that you need to react to make 15.6 moles of water. Well, how do we proceed? Well, I think you know already, the first thing I'm going to do is find out what units do I want my answer? What am I trying to find? And the answer to that question is moles of hydrogen. What am I given? I'm given that. And there's another thing you'll be given. And that is On any problem like this, I'll always give you a balanced chemical equation, because you need that also. So how do we proceed? Well, we only have this number to start with. And what do I want my answer to be? Moles of hydrogen. And now we use our good buddy, remember I'm going for the Guinness Book of World Record, our good buddy, our good friend, unit analysis, whatever I'm trying to get to, the units go on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of, the units go underneath. get them from the balanced chemical equation. What do I want? A relationship between moles of hydrogen and moles of water. And the answer to that is every two moles of hydrogen make one mo two moles of water. I'll say that again. So I was looking over here and cheating, not cheating, getting sidetracked. Two moles of hydrogen make two moles of water. So for every two moles of hydrogen, how many moles of water do I make? Two. Now I get out my calculator. Now for this one, I don't need my calculator. But something very important. The numbers, the coefficients of a balanced chemical equation are always whole numbers and are exact numbers. Therefore, these never play a role in how many significant figures your answer should have. If we look at this, these never play a role, how many significant figures. Therefore, I have three significant. I better end up with three significant. I do the math. Hold on one second. I've got to calculate this now. And this was a simple one. 
you get 15.6. The important thing to understand is the coefficients of a balanced chemical equation tell you the molar ratio. In this case, two moles of hydrogen react when there's no number, it's number one, one mole of oxygen to make two moles of water. Now, why don't you try this one on your own? And the question would be, how many moles of oxygen are needed to react with excess, this should be hydrogen now, an excess of hydrogen to make 3.111 moles of water. How far? And like I said in this slide, the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation give you the ratios. And we're into practice time. Isn't that nice whoever made these slides gave us time for practice? All right, looks like everybody's done. Let's do this. And the question is, what are we being asked to find? Moles of oxygen. What are we given? We're given 3.111 moles of water. We're also given a balanced chemical equation. See, it even says on the board you're given that. And you know boards don't block out of that slang. But anyways, back to real chemistry. So, how do we proceed? This is the only number we have to work with. If I have a ratio and I could convert it to my answer, what units do I want my answer? Well, we took the time to figure that out. Now you'll use unit analysis. Good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. Hopefully over the weekend you all think about that because it will help you on the next test of the others. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath the ratio. And where do I get those numbers? From the balanced chemical equation. And I want a relationship between moles of oxygen, moles of water. Where do I get that? No number there, that means number one. 
one mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. One mole of oxygen, two moles of water. So immediately, for every one mole of oxygen, I make two moles of water. And now, before I pick up my calculator, notice moles of water divided by moles of water becomes the number one, cancels out. I'm left with moles of oxygen. And therefore, I'm on the right track. Now I'll take my calculator. <coughs> This is the number I get. Now, what's the proper answer? Well, this has how many significant figures? Four. All non-zero numbers are significant. These are exact numbers and don't play a role in the calculation of how many significant figures your answer should be. Therefore, my answer should have four significant figures. I'll let you round that off to four significant figures. Time's up, put down your, no. But anyways, keep the one, keep the first five, keep the second five, keep the third five. The fourth five is my round off number, is that five or higher? I hope you all agree yes. Therefore, I drop that and the zero, the one in front becomes a six, so that's 1.556. Now, you can put times 10 to the zero, but let me remind you, 10 to the zero equals number one, and I'm done. And that's how you use that. And it looks like everybody's getting restless, so I don't want restless students. I'll see you on Monday. Seriously, do uh, chapter five, part one of the mold problems, and you can get prepared for when you're not going to do well on Thursday. I have a nice weekend.